Hello? There you are. We can hear you now. Yeah. Yep. Loud and clear. Okay, Gokhanya Fudge Rov D Trasten in a tier and uh Markinch of Homie Mahor and Sean Kid Charman a Hoss Lawn Oma Clown Satig. Um Homid Fear 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 also uh Fodge a queer riv uh Doc Keen and Lin on and Chuck and Lowered Link we on 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 Teoch the Hodin to Kwe uh on Shin a doubt hall and son sheer gobs to shade. Um Homid Ganera to Commission Sonor with Nuga Morla show. Um Big welcome to you all there, Trasten and Tears. You can see I'm sitting in my car. It's the one sanctuary I have left from my crazy family house inside. So I want to give a big welcome there to, to Cleena Linon, who's coming on board this evening and giving us a, a lecture here on Doubt Hall and discoveries she made, or the rediscoveries, as she puts it, she made in 2016. As soon as I heard that this one was coming along, um, I really now, personally, as an archaeologist, this one has been a highlight for me. So I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, the discoveries that were made, I mean, not only from the point of, of architecture, art, archaeology, it's all in there. Um, and the way in which this discovery sheds new light on not only just the actual passages themselves, the tombs themselves, but the construction of them and the way in which it was discovered is really something that, you know, I firmly believe is going to be in kids' and grandkids' history books in, in years to come. So this is one I've really been looking forward to. Um, at the end, maybe if Kleena's all right with it, there might be a couple of questions we might be able to ask. Would that be all right with you, Kleena? Yeah, cool. Yeah. So if you want to ask a question, just leave it in the comments, and I'll break them down as I get, go along, and we'll, we'll deal with them at the end. So I'll hand you over to Kleena Ilinon. Thank you very much. To Rara Sloan. Uh, Mila Magos, Ben, and um, thanks for everyone for tuning in in these most uh, unusual of times. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done an online streaming lecture and it's definitely the first time I've done one during a pandemic. So bear with me, hopefully it'll all go according to plan. So today I'm going to be talking about um, an excavation I've been directing over the last couple of years of a passage team up in Dave Hall, County Mead. And I like to use the word rediscovery of this site because this site has been there since it was built probably between five and five and a half thousand years ago and it's just over time it has become hidden uh, to us uh, literally hidden in this sense because it was uh, underneath an 18th century house and was covered by the lawned terrace that surrounded it but also it sort of uh, fell um, fell out of the folk memory. There was no local knowledge of this ever having been there. So rediscovering it uh, was a really important find. And this work of rediscovery, um, it wasn't just me, I didn't do it by myself. It was definitely a work of collaboration between my employers and the landowners, uh, Devonish, who are an agri-tech company with an interest in um, sustainable agriculture, and UCD School of Archaeology, who've been undertaking research on the estate uh, for ooh, seven, eight years now, uh, led by Dr. Steve Davis. So you'll see that I referred to this estate as the lands that Dave has got this little logo down here. And it's just what we call the 400 acre estate uh, attached to Dave Hall itself. So where is Dave? Um, now let's see. It is located in County Mead, very close to the Loud border, and it's around 35, 40 kilometers from my house in Dublin anyway. Um, and it's actually situated in a really important and interesting archeological landscape uh, in the World Heritage Site of Brunavonia. And this figure here shows the core area of the World Heritage Site, site shown in red here. Uh, to the north and south, we have buffer zones, and then this solid block here, that represents the lands at date. So it's quite a substantial land holding within the World Heritage Site core area, representing uh, more than a fifth of it in total. So this World Heritage Site is also often referred to as the bend in the Boyne, and this lovely Google Earth satellite image shows that lovely bend in the river. And to the north of that bend, we have a concentration of archaeological activity. And it's for this reason uh, that it was ascribed World Heritage Site status in 1993. And part of that reason was also the concentration of Neolithic monumental archaeology, in particular passage tombs. So we've around well over 40 passage tombs in the area. Uh, and we also have uh, three what we call mega mounds. We have the site of Newgrange that people will probably be very familiar with, 
with its iconic quartz facade and its uh, winter uh, solstice event with the uh, rising sun on the 21st of December. To the northwest of that, we have Neith up here. That mega mound is slightly larger than Newgrange, and it's got this clustering of smaller tombs, uh, I think around 19 in all, dotted around them. These smaller mounds are often called satellite tombs. Off to the northeast, we have Douth Passage Tomb, which is not the passage tomb I'll be talking about today. I'll be talking about Douth Hall Passage Tomb. But Douth itself uh, used to actually be part of the estate at Douth Hall, uh, but it's been in under state ownership since uh, the 1980s. So before I go any further, I know a lot of you would be familiar with passage tombs, but I just want to quickly define what passage tomb is. They are communal burial monuments, but they're much more than that. They were probably used for ritual, for ceremony, and they're also used for building community, for strengthening those community and kinship bonds. They get their name because uh, they're accessed via a passage or a stone corridor that leads to a, a chamber, a burial chamber at the end. As I said, it's a communal burial monument. You get men, women and children uh, buried in those chambers. That stone structure, the passage in the chamber, is covered with mounds either of soil, soil and stone, or just stone. And these stone mounds are often referred to as cairns. Oftentimes at these sites, you also get a ring of large stones going around the perimeter of the outside of the mound. And this is called a curb. These stones are called curb stones. So um, just off to the east of Douth Passage Tomb, which I often refer to as Big Douth, we have the site of Douth Hall. So why did we start working there at all? Well, first of all, I just want to point out a few places that I'll be talking about today. This little square here, this is Douth Hall. It's um, a mid 18th century neoclassical Georgian villa. On its back lawn, we have two mounds here called Site I and Site J uh, that appear, both appear to be passage tombs, smaller passage tombs. To the east of the house and also traveling forward in time, we have Douth Henge. Uh, these are late Neolithic monuments, so they're probably between 500 to 1000 years more recent than passage tombs. And they're large enclosures defined by earthen banks that probably were used for gathering large numbers of people for celebrations. And then off to the west here, we have uh, the main passage tomb at Dave. So the reason we started digging at Dave Hall was the house itself. Um, originally, the house had two wings, one to the south and one to the north. Uh, I think at some point in the 19th century, the southern wing was knocked down. It was replaced by an orangery and then more recently by this conservatory here, which probably dates around the 1920s or 30s. The plan for the house is that it will be a family home for the executive chairman of Devish on Brennan, but they also want to have it open to the public because the house itself is a protected structure. It's got this beautiful Rococo plaster work, particularly impressive on the ground floor. So in order to get this balance between private and public, the architects came up with a design that would involve reinstating the two wings, putting those two wings back and converting the basement floor or the lower ground level into the main living area for the family so that they can go about their daily lives while people are visiting uh, the rooms above them. But in order to do that, we need to get light into this basement level. And the design has put forward the idea that there will be a sunken garden to the west uh, of the house and to the south. And I, I've no idea what this little draw, what this little line here, but hopefully it'll go away. Uh, these are photos of what it looks like. We've got this lawn terrace wrapping around the house. Um, when we start, before we even started excavating there, we undertook a geophysical survey. Geophysical survey refers to a range of scientific techniques that allows us to look under the ground uh, without having to dig. And this was done for us by Earthsound. This image here shows their interpretation of the data overlaying on a LIDAR map. Uh, everything in blue, they considered to be of archeological potential. Everything in green, 
they were suggesting was probably more recent, probably to do with landscaping around the house. And uh, the technique we used right around the house was ground penetrating radar. And from it, we could see that it seemed to be fairly clear around the house. The areas outlined in pink were where we were going to be digging. To the south, there was nothing popping up. To the west, we have this linear feature here, but we knew that that corresponded to an 18th century tunnel uh, that you'll be seeing in a little while. So when we started digging, the first structures we came across had to do with the house itself. The house has a feature called an external basement that wraps around the west, south and east of the house. This basement is accessed by a number of servants tunnels. There is one to the west that corresponds to that green line I showed you earlier, one to the south, and there's actually another one heading off to the southeast that we don't have exposed. And the purpose of these servants tunnels were to allow the servants to get into their place of work, which was a basement level. That's where the kitchens would have been, the furnace, the this drying room, the smoke room. So it enabled them to get into their place of work without being seen by uh, the people who are living above. So a real case of upstairs, downstairs here, but quite a common um, architectural plan at this time and sort of gives you a little bit of insight into the social hierarchy at the time. We also found uh, part of the original southern wing. We've got this sort of semicircular projection or bay here called a bowed projection would have extended up the side of the southern wing. So lots of really interesting information coming out about the 18th century house through this dig. But once we got a bit deeper, we found the remains of something much, much older. We found the remains of a large passage tomb that's around 40 meters in diameter. Uh, so we have, we know this is the southern extent of the cairn and we think we've the northern edge of it here and it measures around 40 meters. This passage tomb has two burial chambers. They're both in the western part of the, one of the mound. One is just immediately north of the servants tunnel and another one to the southwest of the house. We also have part of that uh, curve, that ring of stones that goes around the outside of the mound. We have six curved stones surviving. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the chronological sequence or the life cycle of this monument. Um, you'll be glad to know I'm not going to be going through all eight points. I'm going to be focusing at, uh, at its, the birth of this monument, how it was used and how some people started interacting it, with it. But these uh, amazing constructions, these passage tombs, were built around five and a half thousand years ago. But people kept on engaging with them. We've activity at our site uh, from the late Neolithic, early uh, Bronze Age, but at other sites we also have evidence of Iron Age. At Newgrange there's some Roman coins turning up. We also get lots of med medieval activity. We do at our site as well. And also the modern engagement with it uh, at Dyke Hall, the building of the house on top of it. But also we need to think about our modern day interactions with these sites. So people who sign up for the lottery to get into Newgrange on Solstice Day to experience that. It's all part of the story of these monuments. But as I said, I'm only going to be focusing on these first three stages. Uh, Pre-Cairn activity. So Cairn refers to the stone mound. What was there before they started constructing the stone mound? Two, I'm going to look a little bit at how it might have been constructed and how it might have been used. And finally, I'm going to look at this phase that I call deliberate decommissioning. And I've deliberately not given it a number because we're not sure yet where in the sequence it comes. We haven't gotten dating material from it. Um, when I talk about deliberate decommissioning, I think someone has come along in the life cycle of this monument and deliberately started dismantling uh, at least one of its chambers, possibly both, and then deliberately filled it in. Uh, we do have evidence of this happening uh, during the Neolithic. If we look at Knife, for example, there's evidence that some of its decorated stones may have come from an earlier passage tomb. So are we getting something like this at Dyke Hall, this sort of deliberate dismantling, possibly for reuse of material elsewhere? So what was there before the cairn was built? 
Well, this is an aerial shot of the chamber we were excavating, and you might be able to make out we've got this sort of mottled yellow grey soil here with indentations. And this is the buried grass sod layer, and the indentations are depressions from the stone of the cairn. You might go, well, it's not particularly interesting that in Ireland there was grass underneath a monument, but what we're finding here and has been found at other sites is that this is representing multiple grass sod layers that were laid down deliberately. And it sort of is like a preparation of the site before the stones are brought. This is a section or a slice through that grass sod layer. And you might be able to make out we've got this sort of red rusty line here at the bottom and at the top. And you can't actually make out, but there's actually numerous lines of this sort of rusty red color. Uh, and that shows us uh, the rusty line might correspond to the grass part of the grass sod. So that shows us that we've got multiple layers of grass sod. So before they constructed uh, the cairn, they would have gone somewhere, stripped it of grass sod, brought it to the site and laid it down. We also have evidence of possibly preparing a work surface. Um, here we have this cobbled surface, so smaller stones set into this grass sod layer. And um, having worked on the site during a couple of winters, I can understand why they might have done that because that grass sod layer, even now when it gets wet, is very sticky and impermeable. And this is actually behind one of the big curb stones. So where these ranging rods, these scale bars are five and a half thousand years ago would have been under five or six meters of cairn. And um, this is a, a shot of the chamber we've been excavating after we had removed all of the 18th century terrace material that had been sealing it. So we got rid of all the soil, the brick and lime mortar and got to a point where we're fairly confident that we we're at original deposits of prehistoric layers. So you can see it, all we could see were sort of these orthostats or uprights uh, peeping out from this stony layer from this aerial shot uh, taken for us by Ken Williams. We could start to see the outline of the site. We have uh, the outer wall here of the chamber and we were thinking possibly that the passage uh, might still be surviving under there, heading off somewhere to the southwest, but we kind of had a good idea that it was probably significantly disturbed by the servants' tunnel. This is what it looks like now, and we can see even more clearly that uh, this chamber has three compartments that were formed with using these upright stones, these orthostats coming in from the chamber wall. We have a large compartment here, compartment A, and two smaller ones. But we also came across um, some collapsed structural stones. This one outlined in blue looks like it's another orthostat and we think it could have formed the western side here of compartment C. And this stone outlined in red we think was capstone. So a roof for or sort of a covering for this little compartment. Up here we've another stone that looks very similar to this capstone. So this could have come from another compartment. Uh, we've got another collapsed orthostat here that I'll be talking about uh, a little bit later. And this stone here, uh, we think looks more like a lintel. It's narrower, but still quite long. So it could have been crossing a passage uh, or a chamber roof. In the center of the chamber, we have what we call, or we might have, uh, a stone setting. We've got these two stones at right angles to each other. We still have to remove this layer of stones here, but it could be continuing forming some kind of feature. In compartment A, this uh, large one here. Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. This is what uh, the chamber looks like from the ground level. And you can see how close the 18th century servants tunnel comes to it. So this is the 18th century tunnel leading into the external basement. Um, Four of our orthostats, our upright orthostats, have art on them. I'm only going to talk about these two here, this one first. This is a really beautiful stone. Uh, I love the shape of it. On um, the other side of it, it's got lovely glacial striations on it, where when it was in its original bedrock, you had glaciers going over it. But on the decorated side here, we've got this natural shelf. And all the art beneath that shelf 
with this uh, cup and ring motif. So you've got like a little dot here surrounded by a ring and dots coming out of it. That was executed using a technique called pecking. So in modern stone carving would be like taking a chisel to it and uh, extracting little flakes out of it. But all the art that's uh, above it is incised. So it's like cutting into the stone. So we've got this series of uh, horizontal lines and some lovely radial lines coming down. Uh, this is another lovely photo from Ken Williams. Uh, I always say in my talks, any of the really good professional looking photos are Ken Williams, who's been working with us a lot in this. Any of the so-so photos are my own. Um, this is the other artist that, and it's got this lovely incised decoration going down the vertical uh, long side of it, and it's um, a series of lozenges going down. So uh, some beautiful art. Uh, this collapsed orthostat here, I only recently discovered some art on that, well, relatively recently. It was probably around September or October. Um, I was just cleaning the stones so I could record them properly. And whatever way the sun hit it, I saw the start of a motif on this orthostat. And when it was cleared more fully, we got this beautiful pecked decoration that takes up around a third of the whole orthostat. Uh, We've got these two parallel lines here that run along and then sort of lift up here. Below those parallel lines, you've got a, a series of upside down Vs. And then on the other side of the parallel lines, you've got Vs going the other direction. So a really impressive motif. Uh, this is compartment A, the largest of our compartments. And when we got down to its chamber floor, we found uh, these little stone balls uh, we found more than, I think around hundred, but most of them were this sort of darkish colour. Uh, they're not actually carved, they're Hi, uh, sorry about that. Um, I don't think he missed that much. I, I kept on going after I lost the internet, but uh, I was talking about these little uh, stone balls that we're finding in our largest compartment, uh, that they're naturally occurring. They form inside sandstone. And uh, we found around 120 of them sort of stuck into this sticky clay floor. Um, and it seems that when the passage scene builders were quarrying the sandstone, to build their cairn. They were coming across these little objects, putting them to one side, and then placing them quite deliberately into this compartment, uh, possibly as a, a gift for the ancestors, uh, for the person who's just died, or for the gods. Um, but we'll never know exactly why they did it. Just outside the compartment, we found this lovely little stone bead. Uh, it's actually only just a little bit over a centimeter in height. It's got this perforation here, so it was probably um, worn as part of a necklace. And it also looks like it's been burnt. So there's a good possibility that this could have been worn by the dead person on the cremation pyre. Because in passage tombs, we get a mix of burial rites. We get cremation burial, so sort of little deposits of burnt bone. But we also get occasional uh, pieces of unburnt bone, lots of skulls and long bones. Um, tomb two, we didn't actually excavate. All we did was remove the terrace material that was sealing it. Uh, but even then, we found out quite, quite a lot of information about the possible plan of this chamber. We found the northern wall of the chamber, shown here with this red line. And that red line corresponds to this. And this actually represents all that remains of the roof of this chamber. It's um, four courses of corbling. So this is an orthostat just peeking out and we've got one, two, three courses of stone on top of it. And corbling is the type of structure the passage tomb builders used. Inched further and further in until it was capped with capstone. We've got some lovely um, vaulted roofs in places like uh, Newgrange and Nath, but the size of our corbels here, um, they're small enough, they're around 50 centimetres max, so we probably had a lower ceiling and not as impressive. We have 
Ooh. Five orthostats here outlined in yellow that seem to be in their original position. Two of them here seem to be leading off into a side chamber. So passage tombs um, can have simple chambers where you just have a chamber at the end of the passage. Some of them have little compartments coming off. Some of them have multiple compartments. Often in Ireland, they have three and are called cruciform. So, but here we definitely have at least one heading off here outlined in blue. Uh, this is what it looks like on the ground. This blue line is actually a cut into the soil, like a foundation trench to take uh, the orthostats. And what's really interesting here, this gray sort of uh, reddish layer, that's our buried grass sod layer. And it actually lines this foundation trench. So that foundation trench was cut and then they put the grass sod layer in before they started erecting their structures. Um, how did, oh, we also have this lovely uh, sandstone capstone here. Most of our uh, structural stones is made from gray wacky, uh, like these stones here. It's a lovely sort of bluey green kind of sandstone and it's not local to the area, but it was really popular amongst the passage tomb builders. We think it could have come from Clare Head up in uh, Louth, so probably 20, 30 kilometres away. Would probably have been transported first by sea, then by river, and then dragged up from the river. But this large stone, our largest on site, is a different kind of sandstone. And on the undersurface of it, it's covered in these little cup marks, these circular depressions, some of them seeming to form more complicated motifs. So that's one of the reasons why we think it could have been a capstone. It could have been formed the roof of the side chamber and then slipped off or formed part of uh, the roof of the main chamber. To the north and outside the chamber, I think we have this really little interesting area. It doesn't look too spectacular, but it might tell us a little bit about the construction of the site. And it's this area here. And I think it might represent a ramp. Where the arrow is here, that's our buried grass sod layer. Then someone has come and put a, a layer of small sods, uh, small stones, sorry, and then another sod layer. And that layer is sort of, that ramp is leaning down into these orthostats. Could this ramp have been used to help put these orthostats into a vertical position? Was it used to support them once they were already in position? Or did it have both functions? Um, how do people get into this uh, chamber? We're not sure. Uh, we know that we don't have passage to the north because it's this continuous line of balling. We know it's not to the east because we excavated an exploratory trench there. We think it might be somewhere to the south and southwest, uh, sort of through a <laughs> process of elimination, but also because we've got this concentration of vein quartz, and you often get that near the entrances into passage tombs, uh, most famously at Newgrange. So this is just a, a shot of the site during excavation, and this white line marks the, uh, the edge of the cairn. Everything to the north of it is where the stone mound or the cairn would have been. Everything to the south is slippage, because over time, these monuments, um, I always compare it to middle age as our bellies go beyond our belts. These monuments, the, the soil and the stone spill out beyond its edge, beyond its curb. And you can see two of our curb stones have fallen out of place. This one was probably in here. And this one, which is our most highly decorated curb stone, was probably in this area here. And that curb stone is covered with beautiful circular motifs and spirals. Uh, this whole face is covered. We've got this fracture that has come out. Uh, it happened in prehistory. I would say it wasn't us. Uh, we know that because grey wacky, when it's freshly carved, it's this lovely bluey grey colour but this pattern has formed and up here it's actually cutting through a motif. Um, I like this shot of the site because it gives you a sense of how many different layers of human activity have been piled up on top of each other. This red line marks the surviving height of our stone mound and it only survives to a maximum of probably a metre 50. Originally it could have been anything up to five, six metres high, which would have taken us up to here just underneath those blacked out buildings. But over its life cycle, people have come, they've taken the stone, they've dismantled it. Um, the 18th century builders might get a lot of the blame, but I think when they came to the site, it was already a ruin. I don't think it was a big five, six meter intact monument. They have used a lot of the stone in this structure. They appear to have dug a big 
uh, hole in the center of what was surviving of the mound and we used that material to build uh, their basement structures. You can see how similar the stone and the bold projection and southern wing wall is to the actual cairn material. So uh, an early example of recycling there. So we'll move on to this phase of deliberate decommissioning. Um, looking back again at the chamber where we were excavating, as I said, when we removed all of the 18th century material, we still find that it was filled in with all of these smaller stones. So we started excavating through them. And as we did, we came across those collapsed structural stones. But we weren't finding enough for this collapse to have been natural. So if you imagine this chamber when it was intact, with its lovely roof, if that had collapsed in underneath its weight, we would have expected to find uh, more of the roof elements, more of the orthostats, but we didn't. So that was sort of the first clue that if someone has been messing around here, taking out material. But also another clue were the unusual deposits we were finding associated with this dumping of material into the chamber, uh, including human remains being used uh, nearly to, to seal this chamber sort of ritually that uh, no more burials could take place. Here we've got uh, a human skull and sort of in the top of that deliberate infill layer. It's um, been studied by our osteoarchaeologist, uh, Dr. Denise Keating. She was able to tell us it's um, the remains of a woman, adult, 17 to 25. Uh, what we have here is the top part of the head and the upper part of the face, and it's been deposited, so sort of the inside of the skull is facing up. But what's really interesting is inside the skull, we have the remains of other people. So we have a, a juvenile uh, thumb bone, I think, so a, a young person's thumb. We have an adult finger bone, and we have two hand bones from an infant. We also have a, a claw, bone, claw bone from an animal. We still have to identify that. Uh, and we also found a little hair jawbone. So a really unusual little collection of remains there that uh, doesn't look like it could have ended up in this position by accident. So it looks like someone has put it there deliberately. In tomb two, to the southwest of the house, even though we didn't excavate it, I think we also have evidence for someone deliberately dismantling it. And in particular, this collapsed orthostat was very interesting to me. Looking at this photo, you might think, oh, the reason that this orthostat has gone from a vertical to a horizontal position was obviously the 18th century builders when they were building this structure. But it's actually not the case. When we were excavating this, this stone was covered or sealed by a thick soil layer and the foundation trench for this building was cut into it. So uh, this building did not cause this stone to collapse. And when you look at it more closely, you can see how perfectly it has fallen or collapsed. It misses this orthostat by just an inch or two, and it also seems to be propped up on this smaller vertical stone. So to me, it looks like there's some degree of intentionality of care taken in knocking this orthostat over, but it could also be a case that we've just gone stone blind by spending so much time looking at these stones, but uh, I think I'll stick with my theory. Um, during this project, uh, we also found evidence for uh, two new satellite tombs. We opened up uh, a little trench here, sort of to the northeast of the house. Uh, it was quite a small cutting around two meters by two meters and quite deep down, but we found two curb stones. So uh, that ring of stones that goes around passage tombs. We've a good bit of this one exposed and a small bit of this one. They both seem to have fallen over. We possibly had some stone mound material here. From its location, uh, we don't think it forms part of the big mound under Dyke Hall. It looks like a satellite mound or a smaller mound quite close to it. To the northwest of the house, um, these two grey wacky slabs have been visible for a good few years now. Uh, they're just west of this later addition to the house, Little Cottage. Um, during this project, we cleaned up this area a little bit more. We found another upright here and a possible curb stone there. So we decided to clean this uh, face here, this section through this bank, and it came, became a lot clearer. This is the stone I thought was the curb. I think we've got the remains of a stone mound here. We found another little upright here. So I think we've got a little chamber here that's heading off in this direction. 
but this poor uh, passage to him also has uh, in the middle 19th century now, so around 100 years after Dave Hall was built, someone came along and built this little cottage in top of it. So there have been multiple inter building interventions at the site. So going back to our Google Earth pictures, uh, this project, which is really a commercial uh, archaeology project, so commercial archaeology refers to archaeology that has to do with planning permission, so it's road building, house building, rather than purely research driven, but it's really helped uh, fill in our understanding of this landscape on sort of a micro scale. It's given us a sense of what Dyke Hall might have looked like uh, five and a half thousand years ago. There would have been a large 40 meter uh, mound here. To the west, we have those mounds that we already knew about, site I and site J, and two new mounds that we've discovered. So a little grouping or a little cemetery of at least five passage tombs. And if we zoom out a bit further, we can see sort of the wider doubt landscape. And this project is also stitching that back in. Uh, if we look, we have a uh, big doubt over here and we've doubt henge to the east. If you stand in Dave Henge and look out to its uh, entrance here, you'll go, wow, it seems to be directly aligned on Dave Hall. But that's not the case. It was directly aligned, obviously, on what was underneath Dave Hall. Because with henges, you often get them referencing early monuments. You have to remember when Dave Henge was built, this uh, mound here was probably already 500 to 1,000 years old. And it sort of creates a stepping stone and links Dave Henge all the way back to the big uh, passage tomb at Dave. So uh, finally, I just want to acknowledge everyone who's involved because with any of these big projects, either their excavation or the construction of these monuments, it involved uh, a large number of people. Obviously, uh, Devonish and the Brennan family are uh, partners in UCD School of Archaeology, all the different consultants, in particular for this presentation, uh, Art Saint and Denise Keating, as said, all the wonderful photography was Ken Williams. Uh, we've also gotten uh, a lot of assistance from, and advice from the National Monument Service, but really uh, I have to thank the field crew, because when you're excavating these kind of sites, and particularly where we were, we were kind of excavating at depth, so we couldn't get wheelbarrows in. So literally excavation was stone by stone. We'd often have like uh, chain gangs passing stones to each other and you sort of get an insight into uh, the type of investment of labour that probably would have been required to build these monuments. But uh, it's a, a really good example of that old Irish saying of and this work couldn't have been done without them. Okay, Ben, over to you. Thank you very much, Kleena. That was uh, that was fantastic. It really was. I was I was really looking forward to that since I knew you were coming on. I, I, this has been the highlight for me. So I think you know just the the knowledge that you're gleaning from a site like that. I mean, it has to be from my point of view, anyways, an archaeologist. Like, just describe to me for a second that idea. You know, I know what it feels like when you're coming across something that you feel like is this significant. You know, that hasn't been necessarily seen that much before, but. When did you get that feeling that, you know what, I'm not dealing with my bog standard archaeology here anymore? Um, well, we started in oh, early July 2017, and I had my summer holidays booked for September. I thought it was just going to be a monitoring job. I had an idea that we might come across um, sort of displaced bits of, uh, of passage team because just to the east of the house, um, in the haha, -ha, so it's like the hidden ditch feature that you get in 18th century domain landscapes. They had previously found uh, a large slab with megalithic art, so we knew that the house had probably disturbed something. Um, but the fact that the radar came back would have been relatively quiet, and it's not the fault of the radar. Um, radar works best when there's a void, it captures, it captures the void, so if this had been an in, intact chambers with roof, with uh, roof stones still on them. The radar would have picked up the void within the chamber, but because it's, uh, it's a destroyed monument, essentially, so it's a stone structure filled with stones, surrounded by stones, and then covered with a stony terrace, the radar wasn't able to pick it up. So I went into thinking we could pick up a few interesting things. Uh, the first two or three weeks uh, we were working there, it was working, monitoring uh, 
an excavator and digger. And then when we came across the first chamber, the first one we came across was the one uh, we ultimately ended up excavating. Obviously, we stopped work, contacted all of the uh, authorities, and we moved south of the tunnel and started doing a bit more work there. Within a day or two, we'd found the other chamber, so we had to stop working there. So we moved to the south of the house, and then we found um, the curb stones and was like, okay, this house is surrounded by a passage tomb. So when you're doing it, uh, and I think most archaeologists will agree, you're just sort of focused on the, all right, what do I have to do? Who do I have to tell? What are the next steps? And it's sort of only once you step back from it that you realize how significant it is. And it's it's normally from the reactions of people who come to the site that you sort of go, oh, wow, it, 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 is, it is a huge site. I always used to tell the team that they were ruined for any other excavations after this. You, you can't really top it. No, I think that's probably a fact. I think that's, that's the pinnacle, really, mm. isn't it? You know, mm. no, you can't go and, uh, top that one. Um, we have a question here from German Ali, who's trying to, he's, he's looking at motifs. He wants to see if you've come in any way, kind of a comparison to the, the V-shaped motifs that you're finding there. Is there anything that you know of that's comparable around the country? Yeah, so the, um, the V-shaped motifs on the collapsed orthoset, you do get similar stuff in Ireland, but it's, there's also similarities in in Wales, in Bring Keckley Do, that passage tomb, and also uh, Ken Williams actually sent me a photo of it somewhere in Portugal or Spain. Um, uh, you have it there, so you do get it in um, both in Ireland and along Atlantic Europe. Our little lozenge shapes, having that done incised, that looks quite similar to some art you get in the Orkneys. So there are sort of um, sort of little glimmers of these connections uh, along the Atlantic coastline. And you have to remember that these people, like, um, they weren't just farmers. So um, these would have been the descendants of some of the first farmers in Ireland, but that wasn't all they were good at it. At. They were navigators, they were sailors. They would have come to Ireland via boat. Travel by sea was a lot easier than um, travel across land. So there probably was quite significant connections, and especially between the Orkneys and the Boyne Valley, you see a lot of uh, ideas and uh, going backwards and forwards between the two places. We have a couple of the two or three questions. I'm going to try and get it all in, in one go. But there's a lot of people kind of um, asking about future work. Like, where does this go for you next? I mean, does this, you know, how, how much more of this time does, do you dedicate to this? Is this a lifelong thing? And is there any way of looking at, say, what's lying underneath actual Death Hall itself? Well, as I said, this forms part, um, this all arose from a planning permission condition that was put on for the redevelopment of Death Hall. So we probably have, we're looking in a way that the 18th century builders uh, did so much damage because um, the new foundation for Death Hall is pretty much the same foundation as the 18th century structure. So no further damage will be done to the passage tomb. Uh, there is the possibility that when we start uh, dismantling some of the 18th century structures, which we have to because um, they don't really have um, foundations, uh, we might find stuff running under it. We actually definitely have some of the cairn running underneath the southern wing, but I can't excavate it for safety reasons until that's taken down a bit. We're also going to have to look at all the stone material from the 18th century structures to make sure that there is an art on any of them. And then there's always the possibility when like you're putting services in within the house, you might find stuff uh, popping up. But that's sort of another phase of the project when sort of the building side of things start. Uh, before then, we probably have another two or three months of excavation uh, just to finish off a few little bits and pieces. But um, we're not sure when that's going to happen now with all of this uh, coronavirus madness, but hopefully sooner rather than later. So you won't be uh, you won't be booking any holidays just in case for the foreseeable future. So then no yeah, yeah, wrong. yeah, sure. You're you're jinxed um, somewhere. Something will turn up. But in the yeah. while we are sort of going on with the post ex uh, post excavation analysis, uh, we'll hopefully um, we're lucky. Trinity has agreed to take uh, some of our human bone samples to do ancient DNA analysis. So uh, Dan Bradley and Lara in their 
are going to be doing that for us. So um, we should be getting interesting information from that. It'll be able to tell us amazing stuff on the individual level. So sort of eye color, hair color, what height they might have reached uh, in adulthood, but also placing them within the local population, the national and international population to look at links between different groups within Ireland and outside of Ireland. So I'm really looking forward to that uh, when we get that work done. Yeah, that that really, uh, I mean, that that's that's fascinating. I mean, to be able to kind of get that kind of information. I mean, of course, science meets archaeology is yeah. Mm. Um, I suppose the last the last well, one last question, which always gets asked around these things, is do we know what the symbols and motifs mean on these tombs? But I don't think we do. But I'm going to ask you anyway, not me. Um, well, I like obviously there's lots of different theories. Um, our megalithic art is abstract, so it's difficult to look at something and say, oh, that represents this object or this place. But some people think it could have to do with uh, astronomy, uh, with sort of maps of the landscape. Uh, other people think it's what people were seeing when they uh, went into trances, whether drug induced, dance induced or whatever. It's, and that would kind of explain similarities in this style of motif. Uh, especially the circular motif and spiral that you find really across the planet and through time, could that be explained by um, the human brain and the effect of the trance state on it? But I always just say, look, it's an abstract art with modern abstract art, unless you have the artist beside it, you won't know exactly what they meant to represent. Even with the artist beside you, they mightn't be able to convey what exactly they meant to represent, but it's the beauty of abstract art. You can find your own meaning in it. You can have that connection with it, but it definitely was something important to them. It wasn't just, it wasn't just being done to make a stone look pretty. Um, some of the carvings in Boyne Valley, and oh, I have to say as well, the Boyne Valley is a hotspot for megalithic art. I think we have a third of all the megalithic art in Europe. But some of the examples they're put on hidden surfaces of stones so they might be on uh, a passage orthostat but on the side facing into the cairn so once the monument was constructed some of that art would never have been seen by people so why were they putting the art on it was it to release something from the stone was it a message to people on the other side um but it's a long-winded answer for I don't know, and I think that's the beauty of this art that nobody knows. So it can be it can be whatever you want it to be. Yeah, exactly. It's those one of those questions with no answer, which I think we need a lot more of. Um, there's a hell of a lot of questions and comments coming in, um, and people one of the things that seem to be coming through is where can we follow your work? Can we follow your work? Can we donate to your project? There's lots of questions like that coming in. So. Um, yeah, we're hopefully we've been a bit remiss in our sort of social media presence, like, um, but and especially with sort of the restrictions now, it's really gotten us thinking about allowing people to virtually access Douth Hall, see what's there, not just the archaeology, but the architecture, the research we're doing in terms of farming. So hopefully over the next few months, there'll be more of um, a social media presence and we're going to try and do little videos about little bits of work and once this madness is over we're going to try and stay on top of it and not just not just do it when when we can't get out but have it as a as a, a recurring thing so yeah we're we're getting on to it yeah well I, I have to say i mean you can see from the comments there yourself is people are absolutely they've just they've really enjoyed the lecture all in all it's been a fantastic hour and the, the attendance for this lecture has been i think one of the best that we've had which shows just how important the work is that you're doing. Um, I mean, just you know, to, to, to sit here and to listen about something that stretches back so far and the knowledge that you're getting from it and, and when what's yet to come with that, the, the DNA and everything, I think is going to be fascinating. Um, I do know, I do have to give a shout out to your nephew, Con Dowling, I think, who's tuned in, uh, who's quite good friends with uh, UO Sullivan, I think. We're looking he really forward there, to back there, camping there, in They were planning on having a, a sleepover in Wexford this summer. So hopefully they'll yeah. get to do that later in the summer. Oh, I think they're probably the youngest viewers we've had as well. So more power to them. Very but good. um, look, gen genuinely, clean. I really, really appreciate you coming along and doing this for us. I think you've you've tapped into something there. Are people you can see it by the comments, they're absolutely enthralled with it. There's, there'll be a, a recording of this on the YouTube channel for anyone who hasn't got it if they want to, to spread it or use it or whatever with your permission, if that's all right, Clean. Yeah, it? yeah. 
brilliant. That's great. Well, look, thank you very much for staying with us. Okay. I know no it's worries, a bit tough, for me Best to be luck to everyone. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thanks a lot, everyone. All the best. Sláin, trusted here. Kimi Shivarish, Eran Gaidin. Sláin, Sláin.